Tonight's Reformation Day speech is entitled, Gottschalk, Medieval Confessor of God's Absolute Sovereignty. And I want to explain that title for you. Medieval means pertaining to the Middle Ages. Gottschalk was a 9th century figure, born round about 808, and he died on the 30th of October, we know the day, but we're not so sure of the year, but most reckon 868 or so. Which means that Gottschalk died 1146 years ago and one day. By God's absolute sovereignty, we mean that in eternity... The Almighty chose in Jesus Christ who would be saved and who would not. And then at the cross, the Lord Jesus laid down his life, suffered and paid the price of redemption only for those whom the Father had given him. And in time, in accordance with his eternal election, On the basis of Christ's death as a propitiation for sins, God saves all whom he wills to save. And then there's that word confessor. Gottschalk medieval confessor of God's absolute sovereignty. Well, by a confessor we mean one who boldly professes the truth of God's word and is persecuted for it, yet is not actually killed for the faith. That would make that person a martyr. Gottschalk was a confessor, persecuted severely for it, but not killed it, killed for it, a martyr. The persecution endured by Gottschalk included his several ecclesiastical trials, his being deposed from the priesthood, his excommunication by the church, his being brutally flogged on two occasions, which left him nearly dead, and his being imprisoned so that he was under house arrest for 20 years and never was released so that he died in that miserable condition. And this is Gottschalk praying regarding his confession of the truth when under pressure. He prayed to God for help. Through the invincible power of your gratuitous grace, that I may now truthfully and simply confess with my mouth unto salvation what from you, through you, and in you I have long believed in my heart unto righteousness. Romans 10. Thanks to you about your foreknowledge and predestination as I have already repeatedly confessed it through your grace. In order that at long last the truth, invincible and blessed without end, may on my part be disclosed to your elect, and may likewise bring it about that falsehood is defeated, and also justly accursed, as it ought. Amen. So now you understand the title. Gottschalk, Medieval Confessor of God's Absolute Sovereignty. And let me give you a very brief potted history of Gottschalk, emphasizing God's sovereignty in his life and the meaning of his name Gottschalk, which is appropriately God's servant. Gottschalk, God's servant. Gottschalk was born in the early 9th century in Saxony, Germany, the region where Martin Luther would be born over six centuries later. 
He was the son of one Count Bernus, or Bern, or Berno, the spelling differs. So he was a nobleman's son. While only a few years old, Gottschalk was given to the great Benedictine monastery at Fulda in Hesse, Germany. All in accordance with the sovereignty of God in order that he would be trained to be what his name said he would be, a servant of God. When Gottschalk attained to maturity, he was forcibly made a monk. He objected, he protested, he took it to the church's courts, but later he submitted to God's sovereignty. Then, through his studies of Holy Scripture and the great Augustine, he came to believe that he was truly God's servant in Jesus Christ because of God's sovereignty in salvation. And later, he was slandered, tried, condemned, excommunicated, and imprisoned for preaching the absolute sovereignty of God as a courageous servant of God, Gottschalk, living up to his name. And under house arrest for nearly two decades, this servant of God turned from preaching the sovereignty of God to writing many treatises on God's sovereignty. And finally, this servant of the sovereign God was refused the sacraments and refused burial in consecrated ground after his death in 1868 or so. We read Psalm 135. The first verse calls us to praise the Lord O ye servants of the Lord, all ye gotshots. Because, as verse 6 says, whatsoever the Lord pleased, whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted to do, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. Now I want from various perspectives to explain the greatness and significance of said Gottschalk. First of all, I want to point out that Gottschalk stayed at some of the most important and prestigious monasteries of his day. In Fulda, in central Germany which was founded by Sturmey who was a disciple of Boniface the apostle to the Germans at Reichenau in southern Germany very close to the border with Switzerland which was another very famous place of learning in his day and then at Corby up here in north eastern France an important monastery with much intellectual activity and a very impressive library where some great battles took place also in the ninth century on the subject of the Lord's Supper in which a certain Ratramnus stood for what is now the Protestant and Reformed doctrine of the Lord's Supper in the main. He also stayed at Orbe also in northeast France, after which place Gottschalk is named. In the literature, he's typically called Gottschalk of Orbe. And finally, the fifth of the monasteries, Haute Villiers, Haute Villiers, near Orbe in northeastern France, where Gottschalk died. This is also the monastery where Dom Perignon, a Benedictine monk, over 1800 years after Gottschalk, 
would help develop Champagne. Now, through his training and studies at these monasteries, with their libraries, Gottschalk developed and honed his God-given abilities. Gottschalk was a very noted poet. And most people reckon that Gottschalk wrote the dedicatory poem in the famous Ebo Gospels, which were produced at Haute Ville. And this is the cover of the Gospel according to John. Gottschalk also wrote some hymns, and you can see the measure of the man in the hymns that he wrote, very different from what people like to sing today. Freely you created me by your goodness. Freely create me afresh, I pray, and restore me to life. Freely you bestow your gifts, which is why we say they are by grace. O Holy Spirit, you bring instant life to those you breathe into. Together with the Father and his Son, you thunder forth, govern, and give light. You increase and you quicken the faith which you grant to whomever you choose. And as well as poetry, Gottschalk wrote several books on grammar. But it's particularly for his theology, and especially his teaching on God's sovereign grace according to his eternal predestination that he is famous. Other interests and topics in his writings include the Lord's Supper, on which he was very good. He was a friend of Ratramnus, who took the right view of the Lord's Supper. He wrote also about the Trinity, and there are questionable elements, sadly, in his teaching in that area. He was interested in the subject of the Antichrist and the beatific vision, a medieval way of speaking of the blessedness of the vision of God when one dies. Gottschalk also had a prodigious memory. This is the claim of Rabanus Morris, who was an enemy of Gottschalk. He writes, Gottschalk is able to recite from memory all day long without any break not only the scriptures, violently twisted to his opinion, that's Rabanus Morris' view, but also mutilated statements of Catholics take out mutilated. He was able to quote all day long statements of Catholics, and Catholics doesn't mean Roman Catholics. Catholics means the fathers of the universal church, especially in the West. Poetry, grammar, Theology aided and abetted by prodigious memory. Now through his labours, Gottschalk was very widely travelled for his day. He spent time in Germany and France and then into Italy and then to Croatia, which would of course have taken him through Slovenia and through other parts of the Balkans, the former Yugoslavia, and even into Bulgaria. There are others who say, and I can't verify for this, that Gottschalk made it so far as Constantinople, Turkey, or Caesarea, Israel, or Alexandria, Egypt. Now, in connection with his travels, Gottschalk, this double predestinarian, was also involved in various ways in missionary work. Fulda, that monastery in the heart of Germany, 
Fulda, where Gottschalk was brought as a small boy, was the center of missionary work in Germany and to the east, because this swathe of Europe at this stage was pagan, as was northern Europe, Scandinavia. So he was brought up in a missionary monastery. And then, not just involvement through interest and prayers and missions to the east, but involvement to the southeast with the Slavs there. Gottschalk went to Croatia and to the Balkans. This time, he was personally involved and he preached. He preached the absolute sovereignty of God, including in missions and the conversion of the heathen. And he was not alone in this missionary work. He was accompanied by one also called Gottschalk. And he was big Gottschalk, if you will. And the other one was little Gottschalk. So there were two servants of God. And there were probably other monks too. In his time in Croatia, we'll home in a little bit on Croatia. In his time in Croatia, Gottschalk stayed with one Terpremir. And Terpremir was the ruler of Croatia. And Gottschalk lived in Split. Near Split, or in the round Split. He spent some time in residence in Split. <coughs> and there's even a small church. In this place, Nin, K-N-I-N, or N-I-N, which some people reckon, and that's a picture of it, which some people reckon was founded by Gottschalk in the 9th century. This little church now used for funerals in Croatia. And it was through his involvement with Terpamir at the beginning of written records of the Croats and Croatia that Croatians look back to Gottschalk, at least the historically minded Croatians, as involved in the beginning of their people. And so in 1996, a Gottschalk stamp was produced in Croatia so that if you'd wanted to send some mail or post, you could have put Gottschalk in the top right-hand corner. So there's Gottschalk in missionary work, brought up in Fulda, trained there in Germany, thinking of the missions to the east, and then in the Balkan mission when he himself preached. There's another connection between Gottschalk and missions. With Gottschalk and Denmark and Sweden to the north. Gottschalk was a friend and correspondent with one called Gisselmar, who was a co-worker of this man, Anskar. And Anskar was the apostle of the north. He brought Christianity to Denmark and Sweden. And this is a picture of Ansgar, the statue of him in Copenhagen. Well, anyway, Gottschalk not only met Gisselmar at Corby, one of the monasteries, but Gottschalk wrote one of his books called Tome to Gisselmar, this friend and associate of Ansgar, in which he teaches Gottschalk. To Gesselmar, as he's going off to Denmark. Salvation is all of grace. It all comes down to eternal, unconditional election. So that Jesus Christ dies for the elect alone on the cross. And all of those given to him by the Father persevere in holiness. And none of them perishes. Staying with the Danish-Swedish theme, this Anskar had a biographer called Rimbert, 
And by the way, you don't need to remember all these names. I'm drowning in them already, but hang in there. He had a biographer. Just remember a biographer. Don't forget about Rimbert. He had a biographer about whom we read, quote, He was notably sympathetic to Gottschalk's ideas, and therefore there's a strong predestinarian theme in the life of Ansgar, the apostle to the north who went to Denmark and Sweden. And the thought that Giselmar's tome could be influencing Giselmar and Ansgar, and they're bringing something of that to these Norsemen, is indeed a very lovely one. So here we go back to our map of Europe. Gottschalk's doing missions down in the south and east. He's well aware of missions to the east. And he sends his prayers and books with Giselmar for the mission to Denmark and Sweden. Gottschalk was dealt with, euphemistic way of putting it, he was dealt with at many councils and synods, some of which he was there personally in the flesh, other ones they dealt with his case in absentia. In his early ministry, there were church councils which dealt with his desire to leave monastic orders, to quit being a monk and to grow again the hair on the top of his head. And so there were synods and councils at Mainz and at Worms. There was a diet at Worms in which Luther appeared. Well, there was also a synod or council at Worms in Germany that dealt with Gottschalk's desire to get out of being a monk. And then there were a large number of synods and councils rumbling on for at least 15 years to deal with his teaching. It gave them such a headache on predestination. Synods in Mainz, Kiersey, Soissons, Back in Kiersey again, Valence, Savonnière, Toussy, and Metz. Fifteen years, the whole church world know about this big case involving Gottschalk and predestination. And so it was through these controversies involving Gottschalk and the various synods throughout northern Europe and even in the south, he came to the attention of and even met some of the greatest political figures in his day. The greatest political figure in the West of Europe in the Middle Ages was a man called Charlemagne. I reckon many of you have heard of Charlemagne. Well, Gottschalk met Charlemagne's son, Emperor Louis the Pious, because Louis the Pious, the emperor, presided at the Synod of Worms. And Gottschalk was there, this son and successor of Emperor Charlemagne. To simplify matters, Louis the Pious's three sons, three grandsons of the great Charlemagne, had the empire. In Western Europe, divided up between them. Charles the Bold took this swathe, Lothair took the middle swathe, and then we have Louis the German taking the east. And two of these three grandsons of Charles Charlemagne presided at synods where Gottschalk was being tried, and the other one convened a council. To deal with Gottschalk. You don't need to remember all the names. But you get the idea. That from the lowest to the highest. And the really really high. Everybody knew about Gottschalk. And what he stood for. I said earlier. That Gottschalk labored in northern Italy. Well. There he was protected. By one called Margrave Eberhard of Fruley. And this man, Eberhard, married the granddaughter of Charlemagne. So wherever he goes, 
he's dealing with the grandsons or the granddaughter of Charlemagne. And then Gottschalk from Italy under the protection of Eberhard preached in northern Italy and preached into Austria and even again into southern Germany into Bavaria around the Munich area. All the while, and we're dealing with many years here, he is preaching double predestination widely and gaining many converts. After which he went into Croatia and was protected and friendly with Terpamir, the ruler of Croatia, who founded his own dynasty and who defeated the forces of the Byzantines from Constantinople in a battle. So he's rubbing it with rubbing shoulders with some very mighty figures, but then he himself was the son of a count. So he was the son of a minor nobleman, Berno. Now obviously enough, if he's in contact in various ways with the leading civil rulers, which you probably wouldn't have expected, he is definitely getting even closer and more personally involved with the most prominent churchman of his day. Charlemagne had a famous biographer, a man called Einhardt, Bishop Einhardt. He met Gottschalk. Wallafed Strebo, the great scholar, was a lifelong friend of Gottschalk. They met at Reichenau in the monastery near the Swiss-German border and studied together. Pope Nicholas Well, once when Gottschalk was under house arrest, he smuggled out a letter through a monk who smuggled out of the monastery to this Pope in Rome. Pope Nicholas even showed, according to many statements, a certain amount of sympathy with what Gottschalk was teaching. (laughs) And amongst Gottschalk's enemies and opponents were some of the greatest and most powerful ecclesiastical figures of his day. I'll mention the names. You don't have to remember them. Rabanus Morris, Hinkmar of Reims, Amalo of Leon. This is a roll call of the great in the church of his day. They were all writing against, trying to deal with this gotcha. And he was also opposed by the greatest scholar and philosopher of his day who was from Ireland John Scotus Urigena who was asked by Gottschalk's enemies to write a book against Gottschalk the only problem was that this Irish monk the deepest philosopher of his day was a total heretic who even denied the existence of hell and even the existence of evil and taught that everybody was going to be saved which redounded to the great shame and confusion of all those who attacked Gottschalk. Because now there were three views in the fray. The Arminian view, for simplification, the Reformed view of Gottschalk, and now this universalist view of this weird Irish monk. But Gottschalk too had some support some of whom came the whole way or almost the whole way or most of the way with him. (coughs) Remigius, Prudentius and Retramnus, for instance. And after listening to that pretty heavy, impressive amount of information, you will at least understand why one scholar wrote that this issue of Gottschalk and predestination was, quote, the most animated. That's putting it mildly. The most animated. Indeed, lots of people were hot under the collar. The most animated controversy of the ninth century. (coughs) The most animated controversy of the ninth century. It involved, a brief recap, many monasteries many countries, many rulers, even the son 
and three grandsons and a granddaughter of the great Charlemagne. It involved many churchmen, even all the way to his holiness, the Pope. It involved many councils and synods, 15 years of them, dealing with Gottschalk from the predestination point of view. It involved many decrees, many writings, many letters for and against him, rumbling on for several decades. Because the issues involved were theology, the gospel, missions, preaching, the church, and church discipline. Intriguingly, canon law, the medieval and Roman Catholic way of speaking about church order, was repeatedly broken against Gottschalk. Not only were they wrong in the truth of the issue, the church on the whole condemned Gottschalk, but they also were wrong church politically. And so it was that Remigius, at the time, pointed out they're breaking their own laws. They're not doing this according to canon law. And various scholars who have analyzed it today said they're twisting their own rules because they don't like Gottschalk. Look, look, they broke these. Look, they're breaking that, that, and that. And I say this is interesting because this is what happens in at least almost all cases of the abuse of church discipline. They break the orders and rules that are set down in the church for the lawful disciplining of those who err in the church. And the reason, of course, for all this controversy is it's dealing what is, with what is the great subject in the Christian church, the absolute sovereignty of God. It's always controversial because the devil hates it. And it's always controversial because the departing church and churches cannot stand it. They're always trying to wriggle around it. And then comes what the church really hates. Gottschalk, that is, a preacher and a defender of this truth who is learned and resolute. He has the rulers in church and state in Western Europe at him for many, many years... And he never yielded a single inch or a centimeter. He stood firm. That's the situation we deal with in this lecture. Here's an earnest monk and a priest, defrocked, excommunicated, under house arrest for 20 years by the church. The church is doing this. And why? Because he upholds the glory of God in his sovereignty, which is taught in the Bible and was confessed by Augustine, the greatest church father, whom the church professes, though it doesn't really, whom the church professes to honor and uphold, just as today many say we're Calvinists, we hold what Calvin says, but they don't really. They neuter Calvin's teaching and then claim that to be the message of the great reformer, just as the medieval church has been doing with Augustine for, and in the Roman church, for 1,500 years. Now all of this raises the important question, how come, if Gottschalk is so important, and this was the most animated controversy in the 9th century with all these figures and places involved, how come, how come this man and his writings are not better known. Did the reformers know about Gottschalk? The answer to that is that Luther, Calvin, and the rest of the reformers never <coughs> refer to him because the manuscripts of his works never reached them. So they were oblivious of Gottschalk and they hadn't read anything which he had written. It was only later, about a century after the Reformation, and it was only through part, a tiny section of his writings, that Gottschalk's theology came to light. And the first Protestant 
to write about Gottschalk was James Usher, the Irish Archbishop of Armagh in 1631. And the Swiss Reformed theologian Johann Hottinger wrote about Gottschalk in 1718, but both those men and others, and I'm not going to mention, they're writing in Latin. Latin is the language of doctrine and church affairs in Europe in the 1600s and the 1500s, pretty much, but not exclusively. When you ask, was the first English translation of Gottschalk, well, that only came about in the 20th century. For the first time, for the first time, have we lost it? I think that'll do. For the first time, we have Gottschalk in English only in 1978. And Gottschalk's works, two of them, many more came to light and were published in English later, were, were translated and published by a seminarian in America at the Protestant Reformed Seminary, someone you know, who translated the first works of Gottschalk into English. Reverend Ron Henkel, our former pastor. And he translated into English for the first time some works by Gottschalk on predestination in that most prestigious literary vessel, the Protestant Reformed Theological Journal. Something else happened, though, in the 20th century of great help regarding Gottschalk and the truth of sovereign grace. Many more texts by Gottschalk turned up beyond the two that Reverend Henko translated, the shorter confession and the longer confession of Gottschalk. In 1930 and 31, and afterwards, in the library of Bern in Switzerland, many works by Gottschalk were found, including unknown writings by Gottschalk on predestination. And a few years later, they were published in Latin, because Gottschalk wrote in Latin. And even then, now we're talking 1945, when they were published, many of them, in Latin. Even then, very little was written about Gottschalk's teaching on God's sovereignty, because 1,100 years later, sorry, not 1,100 years later, I, or to, to today, it's still too hot. People don't want to deal with it. But now, in 2010, we have this book, picture on the screen, which contains all of Gottschalk's writings on God's sovereignty in one convenient volume, along with some additional writings by his opponents at the back, by Victor Genki and Francis X. Gummerlock, one a Russian, Ginky, and the other an American, Gummerlock, and they're working together. And in one place, in that work, we read, quote, I am indebted to Ronald Henko, whose earlier English translation of this larger or longer confession in Gottschalk's Doctrine of Double Predestination in the Protestant Reformed Theological Journey, Journal was helpful in many places. And he has other references to Reverend Ron Henkel and a reference to Prof. Henkel and Reverend Herman Veldman. Which brings us to this question, if you're still with me, because there's a lot of information tonight. What did this medieval confessor of God's absolute sovereignty, what did he confess about God's absolute sovereignty? Let's start with election. 
which is where Gottschalk typically started. Gottschalk taught that the elect were chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world to salvation and holiness and glory. And his opponents countered by saying, yes, there is election in the Bible, but it is conditional. Sounds familiar. It's conditional. That is, God chooses those who choose him. God foresees who will believe. And that's the decisive factor, their activity of faith. And therefore, God chooses them. Which is exactly what the semi-Pelagians taught in the early church. And what Roman Catholicism taught and teaches. And what Arminianism to this day teaches too. Gottschalk taught sovereign unconditional election. Gottschalk also taught, secondly, sovereign unconditional reprobation. That is, the God eternally determined not to save, but to pass by and ordain to destruction a certain number of men and to punish them of their sins and the main opposition to that was well yes we know that Augustine and others in the early church said something about reprobation and the Bible seems to say it here and there but if there is a reprobation it's conditional conditional some of them would say we can go halfway towards you God shock Election is unconditional. We'll agree with you on that. That God graciously saves some people, choosing them before the foundation of the world so that Jesus would save them from their sins. But reprobation, reprobation is conditional. We can't agree with you on that. We believe that reprobation is conditional. That is, God foresees that certain people will not believe. And therefore God says, in effect, I will not save you. So they say no to God first and causally and then God says no to them and then that is called reprobation. And little has changed in the 21st century because the vast majority of those who call themselves Calvinists today also deny sovereign unconditional reprobation. They're just as bad as the people whom Gottschalk opposed in the ninth century. They say, we're Calvinists. We believe in election, but we don't believe in reprobation. No, those who do not believe in reprobation are not Calvinists. Calvin taught reprobation as well as election. The canons of Dort, from which we get the five points of Calvinism, say election and reprobation. The Westminster Confession, election and and reprobation. You can't have God choosing to save some and not choosing and then leaving out his not choosing of others. Both together. God shall taught, number one, unconditional election, number two, unconditional reprobation, and number three, he joined the two together, he taught double predestination. You say, well, you've already said that, but there's a bit more to it. He taught double predestination. That is, it wasn't even that there are two decrees. It's rather there's one decree with two aspects. It's one decree with regard to men. And he mentioned angels too. One decree of election and reprobation. One twofold decree. One double decree. One decree with two aspects. And at this point... Gottschalk is more forceful, clear, and emphatic than Augustine. There's a real development here so that Augustine's disciple goes further and deeper into the truth than even Augustine himself did. Augustine taught double predestination. Many people today, including Protestants and Reformed people, deny that. 
But Augustine definitely did take double predestination. And Gottschalk himself proves it in his quotations from Augustine. But Gottschalk is sharper, more emphatic, and much more antithetical than Augustine on this point. And if I were to ask you here, what do you think people said to this? Your guess would, in all likelihood, be right. They'd say, so God decrees who's going to be saved who isn't as one double decree. That makes God the author of sin. That's exactly what they said in the 9th century. Just as they said at the time of the Reformation in the 16th century, just as they say it today, that makes God the author of sin. And you can explain to the cows come home and they don't want to know. And with regard to man, they said, this is what they were saying in the 9th century, they said that makes man a stone or a stock. And the canons of Dort respond to that, and Calvin respond to that, and we can answer that time and time again, but they said the exact same, same old tired argument. When, they are, when I say tired argument, it was a tired argument 1,200 years ago. It was a tired argument over 1,500 years ago when Augustine was dealing with it. And it's still coming around. And then they used what's called the lazy argument. The lazy argument. That is, well, if I'm going to be saved, I'm going to be saved. If I'm going to be lost, I'm going to be lost. May as well do nothing. That's not what we teach. No. God elects and God reprobates. And God comes to you with a command. And he says, you must repent and believe. You don't jump ahead into God's inscrutable, invisible decree. You face God's commands and he commands you to turn from your evil way and receive life in Jesus Christ. Unconditional election, unconditional reprobation in one double decree which leads Gottschalk to this fourth truth. Gottschalk taught emphatically, repeatedly, that God's saving desire is always and only effectual God saves all whom he desires and wishes and wants to save and God does not desire or wish or want to save everybody he was crystal clear in that even more emphatic and forceful than Augustine and when you read Gottschalk's writings neatly brought together in this fine book you will see that though he quotes many, many scriptures to make this point, he especially quotes two. The very same two that Augustine kept quoting time and time again. Psalm 135, verse 6, which we read earlier. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, whatever he wished, whatever he wanted, that did he in heaven and in earth and in the seas and in all deep places. The other text was Psalm 115, verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And when you read Augustine, you'll also see not only those two scriptures, but many more. But you will see that he particularly brings in two divine attributes. And the first one is God's immutability. He quoted James 1 verse 17 and many other texts that with God there is no variableness, no shadow of turning, no variableness whatsoever. He's unchangeable. He unchangeably desires to save certain people and he never <coughs> even for a while wants to save those whom he has decreed he will not save. He's unchangeable. Absolutely immutable. The second thing that he makes he makes clear is that God is omnipotent, all powerful. Whatever God wants to do, he does it because he's God. You and I have limited intellects, our arms are weak, we don't have money, our health is variable, all sorts of things happen which take us unawares. There are many things that we want to do but we can't do. God suffers from no such limitations. Whatever he wants to do, because he's perfectly blessed, he does it. And nobody can stay his hand. 
or say unto him, What doest thou? As Paul says in Romans 9, Who hath resisted his will? Nobody. So it is that Gottschalk said, All I'm doing is teaching what Augustine said centuries ago. This is the teaching of the great Fulgentius of Rusp, who was the leading North African bishop in the 6th century, who strongly opposed this notion that God wants to save everybody, but apparently hasn't the strength for it and can't do it because there's all sorts of contradictory notions in the being of God. And Augustine said, uh, and Gottschalk said at this, this point, this is Catholic teaching. This isn't just one strand in the church. This is the one and only teaching that there should be in the church. This is Catholic. That is, this is universal. This is what the best people in the church have always taught. And the other teachings are error. And he even said that those who opposed him on all these points were teaching heresy. Contrary to the scriptures, contrary to sound theology, and contrary to the true Catholic tradition in the Christian church. As summed up in Augustine and developed by Fulgentius of Rusp and others. And can you guess the number one scripture text which the opponents of Gottschalk urged against him? 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. That God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That was the key text in the 9th century. Just as it was the key text with Augustine in the 5th century. And if you read 1 Timothy 2 and you're not blinded by the foolish notions of modern scholarship, you will see that Paul is talking about all types of men. That God would have us pray for kings and those who are in authority because God will have all types of men saved. And then it goes on to say that God gave Christ a ransom for all. Not just small people, not just people like me and you, but also a few great people in there, including kings and those who are in authority. And what did what did Gottschalk say? He said Augustine dealt with this centuries ago. Fulgentius, Januarius, Caesarius of Arles, they dealt with it too. And in his day, the soundest theologians agreed with Gottschalk. I'll give you their names. You don't have to remember them. Prudentius, Florus, Servus, Lupus, and Remigius. In the later Middle Ages, when the church was going downhill, even some of the key theologians of the Roman Catholic Church looks today, even they opposed the free offer reading of 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Peter Lombard, Bonaventura, Duns Scotius, Thomas Aquinas, they all said 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 doesn't mean that God wants to save everybody. But the so-called Calvinists of our day think that it does. And on our website we have quotes from Peter Martyr Vermigli, John Calvin, John Knox, Zanchius, Christopher Ness, Francis Turton, Abrackle, Henrik de Cox, Meaton, Abraham Kuyper, A.W. Pink, Robert L. Raymond, Theodore Beza, and I'm cutting out a whole lot of them. The best theologians have always seen through that free offer interpretation of 1 Timothy 2. And not only 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, but the other texts that are typically brought up to this day, they were there in the 9th century, and they were refuted. Moving on then, Unconditional election, unconditional reprobation, double predestination so that God's desire is always done in saving whom he wills. Limited atonement. God shock taught that Jesus Christ most definitely only laid down his life and suffered for the elect alone. And that in no way, shape or form or sense did Jesus Christ suffer or die for anybody but the elect. In fact, Gottschalk in the 9th century is stronger than anybody pretty much in the 16th century. And amongst the many texts that he appealed to, John 17 verse 9. I pray not for the world, Jesus said, but for they whom thou hast given me. And Gottschalk points out if he doesn't pray for them, he's hardly going to die for them the next day. He's a priest If he isn't interceding for them, he's not offering a sacrifice for them. And Gottschalk makes many solid arguments. I want to come to them now. Many solid arguments. No, that's not the one we're looking for. I should have have read that one earlier, but I forgot. Likewise, the Apostle Paul says about the redemption of only the elect. 
And then he quotes Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having made a curse for us. Therefore, if Christ redeemed the reprobate from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for them, then therefore they therefore will not be cursed reprobates, but entirely blessed. However, the reprobate will not be blessed, but rather it is evident that they are securely accursed. To them the Son of God is going to say, Depart from me, ye cursed ones, into everlasting fire. Therefore Christ did not redeem the reprobate from the curse of the law, nor was he made a curse for them. Likewise, the apostle says, Romans 8, 31 and 32, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give us with him all things? Therefore, if God gave his son even for the reprobate, then he has given to them with him all good things, and through this also eternal life. But he has not given them all good things. Therefore, he did not give up Christ for them. And this next quotation, Gottschalk or argues similarly from Romans 5 verses 8 and 9. And can you guess, and I think you can, what the main objections to Gottschalk's bold biblical teaching on particular redemption of the elect alone, the main objections rested upon two words. One word was world, and the other word was all. They say, but Jesus died for the world. But Jesus died for all. And by world, they mean everybody head for head. And by all, they mean every human being that ever lived. Gottschalk quotes Augustine speaking about two worlds here's Gottschalk quoting Augustine the whole world is the church he's referring to certain bible texts and the whole world hates the church referring to other bible texts which use the word world therefore the world hates the world the hostile world I'll add the world of the reprobate hates the reconciled world, the world for whom Christ died. The condemned world hates the saved world. The polluted world hates the cleansed world. Likewise, 1 Corinthians 11.32, there is a world about which the apostle says, lest we be condemned with the world. For that world the Lord does not pray, John 17 verse 9, for he is not unaware of that for which it has been predestinated. There are two worlds. The word world in the Bible sometimes refers to the world of the ungodly. And sometimes the world of the elect for whom Jesus died. Just as there are, to take the language of Augustine, two cities. The city of God and the city of man. And in that connection, his opponent said... But surely, since Jesus became a, God the Son became a man, and we're all men, then Jesus became incarnate for everybody. And Gottschalk pursues it to his logical end. He says, you know, Jesus Christ only really became incarnate for the elect. Just like Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. One more step. For Gottschalk, there is no such thing as free will. The totally depraved man can never choose the good, what pleases God, or Jesus Christ, because, and he keeps quoting this verse, John 8, verse 34, man through the fall is a slave of sin, and sin won't let him make that choice. It takes irresistible grace to give a man a will to believe in Jesus. And so, the five points of Calvinism, TULIP, are very obviously and in their entirety taught extremely forcefully by Gottschalk in the 9th century. Total depravity. Oh, he believed in it. All mankind but for grace are slaves of sin. There is no free will. You, that's the T taken care of, you, unconditional election. And the you also means unconditional reprobation as one double decree. That's Gottschalk. Limited atonement, 
Oh yes, there is no sense at all, says Gottschalk, in which Jesus Christ died or suffered for the non-elect. Irresistible grace, very strong on that. The perseverance of the saints, he says, there's no possible way where even one of Christ's sheep could ever perish. And yet, this needs to be said, he teaches these things with a medieval flavor. Because he's only in the ninth century, but he definitely teaches them. And this was an amazing achievement by God's grace for this one who was a servant of God, Gottschalk, teaching the sovereignty of God. And now, have you got the handout? The handout? One side of the handout, the side with least words, with less words on it, you'll be glad to hear. Here we have the views of Gottschalk as set forth accurately by Rabanus Morris, an arch enemy of his. Here's Rabanus Morris writing to Pope Nicholas to criticize Gottschalk. Paragraph 1. He, and he means Gottschalk, he says, as the old predestinarians also said, that as God predestinated some to eternal life, election, so he also predestinated some to eternal death. Reprobation. He says, Gottschalk, as the old predestinarians also said, oh, bless these old predestinarians, that God does not will all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, but only those who are saved. However, all those who are saved, whom he willed to save, and for this reason, whoever is not saved absolutely, do not belong to that will that they be saved. Since... If all those whom God wills to be saved are not saved, he has not done whatever he willed. Psalm 115 verse 3, 135 verse 6. And if he wills what he cannot do, he is not omnipotent but weak. For he is omnipotent who has done whatever he willed. As the scripture says, the Lord has done whatever he willed in heaven and on earth, in the sea and in all the deeps. Psalm 134 verse 5. And that's the numbering of the Psalms in the Vulgate, the Latin version, in our English version of Psalm 1 through 5. Next paragraph. That's him opposing the so-called free offer. Next paragraph. Limited atonement. He says, gotcha, as the old predestinarians also said, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was crucified and died not for the redemption of the whole world, that is, not for the salvation or redemption of all men, but only for those who are saved. Next paragraph, again on limited atonement. But that which is proper and specific only to all the elect, which their loving, crucified Redeemer imparted only to them, redeemed, rescued and cleansed those born and going to be born, the living and the dead, that is, all the elect from both past and present sins. These, of course, are the world for which the Lord suffers. As he himself says, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. John 6, 52. And then the next paragraph, irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints. And in another place, that same Gottschalk, oh, and Rabanus hates his guts, also writes, God forbid that I should ever want even to dream or only to whisper that the ancient serpent might be able to carry off with him into eternal perdition any of those for whom redemption, such, for whose redemption such precious blood of our Lord his Son has been poured out to God the Father. Amen. And then the perseverance of the saints, likewise speaking to God, he says, and so it is seen quite clearly that no one who has been redeemed by the blood of your cross ever perishes for you. Finally, let's address this question. How do you know if all this is true? This was the issue in this big controversy of the ninth century. Well, Three arguments from Gottschalk. Number one, what I'm saying is true because this is the Catholic tradition in the best teachers of the church. Augustine, Fulgentius, Isidore of Seville in Spain who taught double predestination. Okay, that's authority. Then Gottschalk said, but even better than that, scripture. And there are places in his works in that book where where he goes through, does Gottschalk, where he goes through the Gospels and quotes all the texts in the Gospels that prove sovereign grace. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and in other writings. 
Scripture. I'm giving you Scripture. But there were some people who still weren't convinced. So Gottschalk said in his larger, longer confession, when he's being persecuted and harassed, I'm willing to go through the trial by ordeal. The trial by ordeal. A medieval idea. The trial by ordeal. Get a big fire, he said, and four barrels. And heat the barrels and what's in them. Now, I don't know if this means that Gottschalk was going to put his hand, as this man's doing, into the barrel of boiling water, which is the usual way from what I gather with ordeals. Or, and his words might seem to suggest this more, that he was actually going to jump into a barrel, like a 40-gallon drum. All right? So that's what Gottschalk does. He says, I'm willing to go through an ordeal. I'm willing to go into the first barrel of boiling water. And if I come out untouched, then you know that this is true. And he says, after that, I'm immediately willing to go into a second barrel, this time filled with boiling oil. And then I'm going to hop into, or else dip the hand in, as I said, I can't make up my mind, a barrel of boiling pitch. And then I'm willing to go into a barrel of animal fat, boiling. And I'm not sure that God, I'm teaching the truth, that God will preserve me and I won't be singed. So God shall present it that way too. The church fathers, the best of them, not Jerome, whom he sees is really off on these points, but the Catholic ones, Augustine, and the church, and then the scriptures. And he says, if that won't do it, the trial by ordeal. And nobody actually took him up on it. Nobody took him up on it. So how can we know in the 21st century if this is true? Well, you could try the trial by ordeal. The the four barrels. But since I'm the one teaching it, I am not willing to go through the trial by ordeal. Gottschalk at that point was led away by medieval superstition. So I'm not going to bring that one tonight. There are no barrels with us. But it is, I'm going to point to another thing though. The best of the church fathers. The best of the church fathers. Unconditional election. Unconditional reprobation as one decree. No frustrated, failing will of God who tries to save everybody but can't. No, no. Christ dying and actually saving his elect. Irresistible grace and total depravity. Including the denial of free will. And the perseverance of all of the saints. Most definitely. That is orthodox, Catholic teaching. But even then, the best proof for it is scripture itself and this is undoubtedly and unassailably the teaching of the holy word of God Amen let us pray our father in heaven we pray that thou would bless this word to us that we may fear thee in our hearts and that we may stand for the truth as thy servant did in the ninth century the truth which has even been developed in many other regards since the 16th century Reformation, that we may be the true sons and daughters of the Christian Church. Give us this faith and hope and love and forgive all our sins and weaknesses. For Jesus' sake, amen.